This city is like no other on Earth. From its penthouses on Fifth Avenue to its pavements in Brooklyn, this metropolis has every type of human activity taking place. But one thing connects all these people, the idea to which this city is dedicated. An idea which connects it to businesses, governments, and people across the globe, and which affects every moment of our waking lives. This is New York City, my city. The city that is an epitome of an idea that changed the world. A bank is a place that will lend you money if you can prove that you don't need it. Bob Hope. My name is Joseph Stiglitz. For some time, I served at the very heart of the capitalist system. I was President Clinton's top economic advisor when his government presided over one of the biggest booms in American history. And I recently won the Nobel Prize for Economics. You might think that all of this would mean I'm an unreserved cheerleader for the idea of capitalism, but I'm not. For while I believe capitalism is the only practical way to run an economy and a society, I'm also, like a lot of other people, worried about the way in which a particular brand of free market capitalism is being promoted around the world. To understand the risks our global economy faces, we need to trace the history of the idea of capitalism itself. And where better to do that than here in New York? The history of this city and the history of capitalism are a pretty good match. From the very first settlers to arrive in the city who bartered and traded in the street markets of Soho, right through to the high finance trading on Wall Street, we see a history of huge growth and the creation of massive wealth. And New York City symbolizes all that is great and all that is deplorable about the capitalist system. As I drive about the city, it's impossible to ignore the visible signs of capitalism in action. I see it everywhere. The things we buy, the things we sell, the money we earn, and the prices we pay are all part of an economic system we all take part in. Of course, people have traded and bartered since time immemorial. It was the Greeks who cut metal into the first coins and invented money. And it's money which has remained at the heart of capitalism ever since. So what is capitalism? To understand that, you have to understand the market. And the most obvious sign of what's happening in a market are the prices. And who sets these prices? We all do. The stall here is competing with the stall across the street. If the price they charge is higher, people will buy across the street. If it's lower, they'll buy here. Here are two kinds of oranges, a large sweet orange and a more traditional smaller orange. If more people like this large sweet orange, the price of the orange will go up. If fewer people like the small orange, the price will go down. And that's how the law of supply and demand works. It gets a balance. It makes sure that the kinds of oranges that people actually want are actually the ones produced. The constant fluctuation in prices in the millions of markets across the globe never stops. And what's happening in the street markets of New York's Chinatown is repeated not only all over America, but all over the world. Ever since the Greeks, people had wondered what the motor that drove this system might be. Some businessmen like to claim that it was altruism that drove them to create wealth. Some thought that the whole system was so perfect, God must be behind it. 
But then a Scotsman came up with a much more sobering insight. Adam Smith was the first person to try to really understand how the capitalist system works. Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations, was published in 1776, the same year as the American Declaration of Independence. Even as an American, it's not easy to say which is of more historical importance. The Declaration sounded a call for a new society dedicated to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Adam Smith explained how the economics of this society would actually work. When Smith was writing, the world was changing. For the first time in history, industry, business, and commerce were taking place on a massive scale. Smith realized that certain things had allowed this to happen. Things like the rule of law, the nation state, banks and financial institutions had created the conditions for a thriving market. These factors gave people, Smith said, confidence to invest their money and to trade. But there was something even more mysterious, something that Adam Smith called the invisible hand. The enigmatic force which drives markets was, Adam Smith said, in fact, very simple. It was the combined effect of millions of people looking after their own self-interest. It was this, not altruism or God, which created wealth. Acting in their own self-interest, people unwittingly generated wealth, which would then benefit society as a whole. Or as Adam Smith himself put it, while every individual was working for his own labor, he intends only his own gain. And he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention, that is, the well-being of society as a whole. Adam Smith's work has been used to back unregulated markets ever since it was first published. But in fact, it's full of warnings. Capitalism, he said, didn't just generate wealth, it could create huge inequality making some people very rich and others very poor. But at the time, the warnings tended to be overlooked, for capitalism was about to take off. At the turn of the 19th century, one of the biggest and most important changes in human history began. The competition among entrepreneurs fueled innovation. As they struggled to find new ways to make money, they invested in new technology. That's what capitalism did, and that's how capitalism enabled the development of the modern industrial economy. Money is the barometer of society's virtue, Anne Rand. From the steam engine to the railroads, new inventions found ready backers. These then meant mass production and rapid transport of goods and services on a scale never seen before and one change led to another. As factories sprang up, laborers moved in their millions from farms to cities. And as investors got richer, money poured into factories, power plants, and mines. Capital, money, was driving the most rapid social change humans had ever seen, transforming the landscape and the way we lived. Now, Millions of people became employees, a mass army of labor disconnected from their old agricultural roots. And not just within one country either, but prepared to move across the globe. And this is where it all came together. America was a rich country, abundant resources. It needed people to take those resources out, to develop, to exploit them. And it was through this harbor and through this building, Ellis Island, that they came. People were pouring into New York City from all over the world, coming here to do one thing, make a new life. My first ancestors came here around the 1850s from Poland. Others came from Belarus, Russia, 
Austro-Hungarian Empire in the 1890s. A typical melting pot family. People coming from all over Europe in search of economic prosperity and liberty. And they were not disappointed with what they found. Pro was here in the United States with no aristocracy and no class system that the entrepreneurial spirit would truly flourish. This water, this harbor, is where the goods that were produced were taken out of the United States and sent to Europe. And over there is the street, the most famous street in America, that made it all possible. Here on Wall Street, in the stock exchange, money was raised to finance the industrialization that was to make America the great economy that it was becoming. Capitalism had finally found a home. Wall Street and its stock exchange quickly became the single biggest concentration of capital in the world. The stock market is often thought to be a baffling place, but it's actually quite simple. The stock market is made up of companies. Each company is divided up into shares. These shares are owned by people or institutions. The stock market allows the buying and selling of these shares. And why are they doing it? Because it allows them to share in the potential wealth a company might create without owning the entire company. You get just some of the wealth by owning just some of the company. But equally, you take only a small share in the risk that those companies take. And how is that good for the economy? It brings together vast sums of money. But what was really important is accumulating that money to build a railroad, to build a factory. You needed more money than any single individual could have. You needed to bring money together from thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. In the space of a hundred years, the population of the United States more than trebled. New York and its stock exchange was driving the huge economic growth in America. And a similar process was going on in the 19th century across the rest of the planet. The capital, which built up in London, made possible the growth of the British Empire. And as the British Empire grew, capitalism spread to all parts of the world. But it wasn't a level playing field. For while Britain ruthlessly protected its own industries from competition, it forced its colonies to buy its products. Instead of introducing a free and open market across the globe, a real possibility for the first time, colonial powers imposed a trading system that was anything but free. And the legacy of these inequalities and hypocrisies remains with us today. The rich colonial nations controlled markets to suit their own interests and created rival trading blocks whose natural resources and trading routes had to be protected by rival military forces. Competition is at the heart of capitalism, but in the colonial era, this competition between empires became poisonous. Economic confrontation grew into something worse. The lap of the money is a road of all evil. There were many reasons for the First World War, but there's no doubt that the unstable political situation between the major European countries was exacerbated by their economic competitiveness. The result? War, bloodshed, and slaughter on an unprecedented scale. After the war, with over 20 million people killed, there were attempts to lower the level of ferocious economic competition among nations. But the faith in capitalism was largely unshaken. The 1920s seemed to many at the time to be the harbinger of good times. After the devastation of war, the rapid rebuilding seemed to prove that capitalism had a new energy. 
millions became investors for the first time, buying stocks and shares with ever-increasing enthusiasm. Nowhere more so than in New York, where the Roaring Twenties saw the city experience a boom which made it the most dynamic and successful city in the world. There had, of course, in the past been booms, but nothing on this scale. And though these booms have been followed by busts, this boom, it seemed, might be permanent. By the fall of 1929, the boom was the longest on record, and there seemed to be no clouds on the horizon. The real measure of your wealth is how much you would be worth if you lost all of your money. Anonymous. On the 23rd of October, 1929, everything seemed normal. One top American investor said, now is the time to invest. The next day would change America and capitalism forever. Adam Smith had said that there was an invisible hand which drove markets. And one of the things that guide that invisible hand is confidence. Without confidence, people will refuse to invest their money. On October 24th, 1929, the value of shares plunged, and suddenly, the rosy optimism of just a day before evaporated. Confidence dissipated. Prices fell and just kept falling. The average share price had peaked at 386.1 on the 3rd of September, 1929. By the 8th of July, 1932, the average share price had collapsed to just 40.5. The stock market crash brought the Great Depression. And with the Great Depression, there was a loss of confidence in the idea of capitalism itself. Industrial production in the United States almost halved in the three years following the crash. Adam Smith had said, people all working in their own self-interest would make the market efficient, but this was far from efficient. With massive unemployment and underutilization of resources, Smith's model was clearly wrong. For the first time, it seemed there was a flaw in the system of capitalism. Confidence in capitalism had evaporated. People were afraid to risk any more of their money. As President Roosevelt said at that time, Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. The meltdown of the U.S. economy was to be repeated throughout the world with every capitalist nation experiencing problems of recession, depression, and unemployment. The forces that this unleashed would prove unpredictable, and in one country in particular, would lead to desperate measures and catastrophe. New York has experienced firsthand the ups and downs of capitalism. 
In the 1930s, following the Wall Street crash and the Great Depression, millions of people here and across the world began to wonder whether the very idea of capitalism was fatally flawed. Fascism is capitalism in decay, Lenin. The collapse in living standards throughout the 1930s led people to look for alternatives to capitalism. And leaders who seemed to offer a way out of the crisis drew huge support. In Europe, perhaps the gravest consequence of the Depression was the rise to power of Adolf Hitler. He ruthlessly exploited disaffection with capitalism. I don't believe Hitler and the Nazis would have come to power in a prosperous Germany. Poverty led to their rise and ultimately to World War II. Fortunately for us all, the eventual victory of the Allies ensured the future of capitalism. Now, though, capitalism would face new challenges. After World War II, capitalism, managed capitalism, that had taken to heart the lessons of the Great Depression, would dominate the scene for 50 years. But for the first time, capitalism had a real competitor. The Cold War, as it was called, between the Communist bloc and the West was, in a sense, a long struggle to protect capitalism and all that it had done for the human race from this rival ideology. Communism was based on the principle that everything was communally owned. This was the complete opposite of capitalism. For 50 years, these two opposing ideologies would slug it out like two heavyweight boxers, often coming very close to conflict and even war. For the real battle, was a battle over ideas about what kind of an economic system would be best to create jobs, promote growth, and ensure the benefit of that growth was widely shared. We here in the West still believed in the system of capitalism, but what kind of capitalism should it be? Unfettered markets, it was widely accepted, had failed. And so from now on, they had to be managed somehow. The very idea of capitalism had to evolve. Institutions like the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Trade Organization were created in the 1940s to ensure the rational, smooth functioning of the different elements of the complex global capitalist system. People hoped these new institutions would prevent the worst extremes of old-style capitalism. Some even hoped that they would promote a fair distribution of the world's wealth. It wasn't just internationally that capitalism was reformed. Within Western nations, economic policy changed radically, and welfare states were created to protect those people in society who would otherwise fall foul of the dynamic market. Of course, not everyone agreed about exactly what degree of regulation was required. But the proof of the pudding of the virtues of this new balance between markets and governments was to be the enormous economic boom of the 50s and 60s. The more money an American accumulates, the less interesting he becomes, Gore Vidal. In the quarter of a century after World War II, the economies of America and the West enjoyed remarkable growth. 
economic conditions were stable, and unemployment remained low and the standard of living rose immeasurably. In the 1960s, for the first time in history, the youth, of which I was one, had a voice, they had power, and most importantly, they had money. And in the West, as a whole, a generation emerged which was perhaps the first to take for granted wealth and security. There appeared to be jobs for all. Consumerism offered a range of choices we'd never had before. All this was the result of an experiment in a new form of managed capitalism. At the time, it seemed as if the experiment might be permanent. But it wasn't to be. By the 1970s, something was going wrong. Growth slowed, and a new combination of recession and inflation appeared. Economists differ on what the real cause of the problem was. Some argue that it was largely a result of the quadrupling of oil prices. Others, that the economic strains of the Vietnam War unbalanced the global economy. Certainly, the war in Vietnam highlighted how the capitalist system could be affected by political and social events. Yet others argued that this turbulence had become endemic. Some suggested it was actually a result of trying to constrain markets. Whatever the cause, the consequences were serious. The global economy experienced recession and inflation. In the UK, this led to falling living standards, which provoked unions into strikes, which culminated in the so-called winter of discontent, when the country ground to a standstill. I think it stinks like all the other damn strikes in this country run by the filthy socialist communist unions. In the United States, inflation reached record highs. It appeared that a radical approach was needed. And it arrived in the shape of an iron lady and a Hollywood movie star. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan had a bold new plan for the world economy. They believed that they could somehow return the global economy to a form of free market, unregulated capitalism. This, they said, would unleash the enterprise of individuals. Allowed to pursue their self-interest unhindered, citizens would create ever more wealth. It is money that begets money. During the 80s, people were encouraged to make as much money as they could for themselves. A type of free market was revived by rolling back the state. Government said they would not interfere with the running of the market. Welfare expenditures were cut the power of the unions was drastically reduced, and public sector industries and services were returned to the marketplace through privatization. Financial markets were deregulated. And for a while, it seemed to work. The economies of the UK and the United States came back stronger than ever. It seemed too good to be true. And it was. You take my life where you do take the means whereby I live. William Shakespeare. The free market approach created enormous wealth. Just as that earlier pioneer of free markets, Adam Smith, had said it would do. But what the proponents of free markets conveniently forgot were his warnings. He said that free markets inevitably led to inequalities, and that's exactly what happened. Most of the wealth created went to a small percentage of the population. It 
created a greater divide between rich and poor. And as markets were freed up, they became more volatile. In the UK, there was turbulence in the financial markets, which culminated in the collapse of the pound on Black Wednesday in 1992. Today has been an extremely difficult and turbulent day. Massive speculative flows have continued to disrupt the functioning of the exchange rate mechanism. In America, too, the late 80s and early 90s were marked by financial scandals which contributed to a full-scale recession. The free market experiment had run its roller coaster course. Thatcher and Reagan wanted to return to a version of unfettered capitalism that had failed so often before. They had failed to learn the lessons of history. The stock market crash and the depression of the 1930s had shown a market left to run free can create huge wealth, but often only in the short term. In the longer term, it leads to a boom and bust form of capitalism, which is by definition as likely to increase poverty as much as wealth. Throughout the 90s, the world's major economies slowly struggled to find new methods to control the capitalist system and safeguard against the extremes of the market. It was not until President Clinton and Tony Blair reasserted the need for a more balanced role between government and the market to growth resurge to levels that had been decades earlier. I experienced it all firsthand. I served in President Clinton's cabinet and supported him in his plans to improve the performance of the American economy. We moved away from a dogmatic obsession with free markets. The only reason to have money is to tell any son of a bitch in the world to go to hell. Humphrey Bogart. And what of capitalism's historical rival? The fall of the Berlin Wall indicated the end of the Cold War. And soon it became clear that the people of the former Soviet bloc wanted the same opportunity to generate wealth and prosperity as we enjoyed in the West. The fall of communism seemed to leave capitalism as a system unopposed across the world. Here, in Times Square, it could almost be a shrine to just how dynamic the capitalist system has become. The relentless stream of adverts are selling goods and products from all over the world. There's long been commerce among the countries of the world, but recently something has changed, and that change is globalization. The term globalization refers to the increasing economic integration and interdependence of countries and companies. Improvements in technology and transportation have opened up the world so almost any company can trade almost anywhere in the world. The result is that many companies have grown in size to become giant multinationals, economic behemoths which stride the globe. You can count your money, you probably don't have a billion dollars. John Paul Getty. Multinationals are able to pursue the aim of the maximization of profits, largely unconstrained. It's this hunger for profits which drives globalization. And this is globalization in action. Goods, people, companies from all over the world coming together. It's produced enormous prosperity here in the United States and in many of the other advanced industrial countries of the world. But many of the poorer countries have not benefited commensurately. The problem is that multinational companies have such tremendous reach and power that they can dominate the governments of impoverished nations 
and muscle their way past regulations. Often, they even have more money than the countries themselves. We now have a truly global economy, but it's not working, or at least working as well as it should. The distribution of wealth among the world's populations is very unequal. One in six of the world's population lives in poverty. Bridging this gap is perhaps the greatest challenge facing mankind today. Those who believe that markets simply have to be left to be free would have us believe that eventually wealth will flow to the poor. But there's ample evidence that this just doesn't happen. The problems of unfair trade agreements first established in the colonial period have never been fully addressed. Many countries in the developing world have been saddled not only with unfair trade agreements, but with enormous debt burdens. For some of the countries, globalization is making their situation worse, not better. These problems need to be tackled. For although capitalism as an idea may seem triumphant now, the excesses of globalization threatens to ruin its reputation. A generation has grown up which associates the idea of capitalism as globalization gone wrong. In effect, capitalism needs to win the hearts and minds of people all across the world. The dangers of not doing so cannot be exaggerated. This was New York City's darkest hour. The attacks in the World Trade Center on September the 11th, 2001, were a direct attack on the two biggest symbols of the capitalist system. Since then, the U.S. government has launched a war on terror, but hasn't neglected the deeper causes of global insecurity. Last year, the United States spent $450 billion on its military and only $15 billion addressing the plight of the poorest of the poor. These poor countries and societies are destabilized by poverty and are often havens for unrest, violence, and terrorism. The future of capitalism is much more uncertain than we are often led to believe. The dangers of globalization must be addressed, but how? International multinationals must be regulated for a start, followed by a comprehensive overhaul of the international institutions which run the world economy such as the IMF, the WTO, and the World Bank, to remove the inbuilt unfairness of the system. And then there's the obscenity of the level of debt poor countries are saddled with. The debt burden on the developing countries is so bad that in many cases money is going the opposite direction from what it should, from the poor countries to the rich. The leaders of the world are finally getting around to the obvious answer. Why not just cancel it? Dinero, dinero, dinero. Tiene que ser divertido en el mundo del hombre rico. Ava. The canceling of third world debt would require an enormous policy shift. But to allow the flaws in modern globalized capitalism to remain unaddressed would be to risk the future of the entire system upon which our own prosperity depends which is why I believe the democratic nations will tackle these problems. As Adam Smith pointed out over two centuries ago, self-interest is a formidably powerful force, and it's in all of our self-interest to make capitalism a fairer system, a system which provides genuine opportunities to more of the world's populations. In the history of mankind, the history of capitalism is but a short event. But the idea of capitalism has probably had more impact than any other idea. In the lifetime of my grandfather and his father, there's been an enormous transformation of the world and the way it's organized, all due to capitalism. It's been the most dynamic period in history. 
and it's not over yet.